In this video, I'm talking with Sovereign Man's founder, James Hickman, aka his alias, Simon Black. Now, James is a brilliant West Point grad and a former Army intelligence officer, so he fully understands the power and control of big government and how asset markets like the housing market can be manipulated based on a greater plan of those in charge. If you like this video, please share it with your family and friends, and I look forward to your comments below. In the beginning, James talks about a little bit of his background while he was in the government, how he moved around the world. Then we dive into some really interesting real estate narratives. I hope you enjoy the show. James, thanks so much for being on our show. <laughs> Pleased to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So, I mean, tell us, who are you and what's with yeah, the alias? What's with the alias? Sure. Everybody always asks me that. You know, it was... Um, I came out of the uh, I came out of the army. I came out of the intelligence business, and it was the the, the guys that sort of uh, invited me into this sort of industry to start uh, writing. I was traveling around the world as a young guy, traveling around the world. I was investing in things all over the world. And they said, "Oh, you should you should do some writing." And because I was an ex intel guy, they said, "You should use an alias." I didn't know very much about this back then, and it wasn't very well thought out. I said, "Okay, yeah, sure." If I'd known it was going to last so long, I would have probably made different decisions, but, you know, it is what it is. But I'm James. Uh, Simon Black is just an alias that I've used for for a really long time, but I'm James. We're, we're pretty transparent about that on our on our website. But uh, uh, that was, God, that was 15 years ago, 16 years ago now. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy to think it's been that long. So you graduated from West Point. It's not easy to get into. I think it's only not. really smart people apply, and one in 10, I think, is their acceptance rate. But being an Army intelligence officer, that's not really easy either. That's kind of hard to get into. I mean, are you just kind of driven to go against the odds? I mean, what, t tell us, like, what were you thinking your career path back then? And Oh, my God. Like, when I I, I thought I, I frankly, I thought I was going to make the Army a career. Uh, but there were some things that I saw early on. Uh, that made me very disillusioned. Um, I think I think the military is fantastic. I think for a lot of people, it's a great career path. But you know, I came in in 2000, and there was uh, you know obviously 9/11 happened. That was incredibly motivating. But you know after that, they started talking about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They started talking about. I mean, this became the the entire pretext for for going to war. And I've told this story a lot that, you know, that night that Colin Powell went in front of the United Nations, it was in February 2003, making the case for war. And I remember that's really the night that my life changed. It was very, it was late. Um, we were already, my unit was already in Kuwait. We'd been in Kuwait for months and months already. And uh, all this case for war that was basically, it was based on faulty intelligence. And I can tell you like that night, there was a lot of there were a lot of phones ringing off the hook in the intelligence community in the United States that night. Everybody wondering, like, where did he get this information from? Because it's all bogus. And of course, we know now that, um, I mean, it's nothing classified. Everybody knows now that all the things that were said about WMDs in Iraq uh, were, was, you know, was not true. And the entire case for that war was was false. And But a lot of people knew that that was the case that night. And I remember thinking to myself, my God, if they're going to lie about something as sort of sacred as that is sort of a case for war. If they're lying about this, then what else are they lying about? I was naive. I was, you know, 22 years old, something like that at the time. But it made me think if they're lying about this, what else are they lying about? And that's when I really started to become a lot more disillusioned and started looking for things, you know, outside of the military. And um, when I got out, I started traveling. I started traveling all over the world, started seeing so many different things around the world, started learning a lot more about business finance, you know, the, the dollar, um, the economy, all these sorts of things. It really started a, a journey that's that I've been on now for, for 20 years. So you finished your contra contract, you just didn't re-up? Uh, basically, yeah. I, I got out at, uh, uh, when I was uh, eligible to do so and, and, uh, and basically been on my own ever since. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, I can see if I was in your position. I mean, I I hear that a lot, though. I hear that we really we're told certain things that don't exist. Yeah, so that kind of happens in my world in the real estate business. Yeah, 
So in the last couple of years, we've had the perfect storm with that. Uh, but you you actually left the U.S. Mm, I did. Yeah, you moved to Mexico for a period of time. Panama, I've lived maybe. in Thailand. I've lived in China. I've lived in uh, Panama, Mexico, Uruguay, Argentina, uh, Chile, um, Dubai. I've, I've lived. I've as lived as a civilian. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a civilian. Yeah, absolutely. And when I was in the military, obviously other places as well. But as a civilian, after I got out, I've lived in a lot of places all over the world. I've been to 122 countries. And I've done business in, in quite a lot of places. Um, you know, we, we've, uh, over time, you know, bought and sold businesses, started companies, uh, taken companies public, done deals with uh, literally heads of state, you know, formed deals with sovereign governments around the world. So I've been able to do quite a bit. And it's taught me a lot about how the world works and, uh, you know, really where opportunities are and, and to look at big picture trends. And now we're sitting in Puerto Rico and Peter Schiff's house. So. That's right. <laughs> your buddy <laughs> yeah i mean peter and i've been friends for god more than 10 years now and um i've been living in puerto rico he was actually the reason why i came to puerto rico puerto rico has um as as i'm sure many of your viewers are aware tremendous unparalleled tax incentives uh, especially for people that are u.s citizens u.s citizens have very unique tax requirements and that if you're canadian or even french or some place that come from really high tax jurisdiction you can at least move overseas to some other country and you're no longer subject to that tax jurisdiction. Well, not true for the United States. If you're a U.S. citizen and you move somewhere else, you move to London, you move to Hong Kong, you still have to pay U.S. taxes uh, for the most part. There's certain exclusions and things like that, which are attractive, but especially high income earners, uh, you know, you still are subject to U.S. tax jurisdiction. And it's crazy. On top of that, there's sort of offshore tax reporting. If you're just a, you know, you move to London because you have a, you know, you have a job there, you know, you're working for some, you know, international investment bank or something like that. You've got to report all these things that the government every year. I mean, it's 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 really quite onerous. Um, but here in Puerto Rico is the, is one of the only places that U.S. citizens can go and essentially completely disconnect legally from uh, the U.S. tax system, and it's 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 phenomenal. And so uh, Peter and I both we have uh, businesses here, and essentially you're business is subject to 4% tax on uh, virtually unlimited uh, income. It's a lot less. It's a lot less. And then on top of that, for instance, in the US, the corporate tax rate is 21%. For now, though, that's probably going to go up. But then on top of that, you've got to pay taxes on on uh, dividends. So you pay qualified dividend rates plus the Obamacare surcharge. None of that exists in Puerto Rico. So we pay 4% corporate tax and then 0%. You that's put 100% it. of it in your pocket and there's no dividend tax. Yeah. The only right. way so, you would do that elsewhere is if you denounced your citizenship. Yeah. If you renounce your U.S. citizenship. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, yeah. which is a, you know, which is a pretty significant step, I think, for, for most people. Yeah. But in a place like this, you don't have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's dive into real estate because I know that is a subject you're very familiar with. Sure. In the last several years, really since 2019, we've had sort of like the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And as I said, you know, uh, on our channel, we talk about a lot of things that you don't hear typically as a real estate broker. Obviously, I make my money selling real estate. So a lot of my peers say, why in the world would you not cheerlead the real estate business? But, uh, you know, I've been in it for a very long time. I started back in 1989 as a contractor and a home builder and developer and all kinds of uh, everything in between. And, you know, so I have seen a lot of things happen over the last 35 years. Never anything quite like this, you know, where the government completely steps in to the industry, essentially, by buying mortgage-backed securities, dropping interest rates to 0%, and allowing this kind of runaway freight train happen right so uh, well, don't don't forget you had uh you had uh what, what was her name rochelle walensky who was the head of the cdc the unilaterally appointed herself as head of the entire u.s housing market and said oh we're going to have moratoriums on you know and, and basically rent controls and yeah. so forth it's like crushed what everything is, what does the cdc have anything to do with the housing market in the united states you know yeah. so it's 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 those sorts of things as well i mean this is extraordinary overstepping of authority that does i mean frankly inventing fictitious authority that doesn't even exist it's crazy to control the market yeah that's that's unbelievable that's yeah. really unbelievable that, that something like this happens in the united states so what do you think is going to happen i mean you know um i watched a podcast uh of you a couple of years ago it's kind of nice because when you look back when we document things like this and we sure. got to advance in time you know but it was at a, at a time when you were saying you know 
um, you know, interest rates may go a little bit higher. You know, they could go down, you know, um, a lot of different things. COVID was happening. It was probably in 21, I think, was the mm. video I'm referring to. Yeah, I remember those days. I mean, one of the things I kept saying over and over again with COVID is, a, is in those early days in particular, there were a lot of people that were talking about, here's what's going to happen, et cetera. And I said, look, the, the last thing anybody likes to hear is, you know, sort of hedging predictions and things like that. But the reality is this is something that has not happened in anybody's lifetime where there's been a complete shutdown of the economy, et cetera. And so you've got to approach everything that was COVID related in those early days from a position of complete ignorance and uncertainty. And so I remember back then we were basically making a case of like, here's a bunch of different scenarios and how they could play out. We could see inflation. You can make a case for deflation. You can make a case for hyperinflation. You can make a case for higher rates, case for lower rates. And at that, at that point in time, there was no you know real clear direction because they were just making it up as they went along. Now we obviously have a lot clearer direction in terms of the trends and, and how all that stuff has played out. So um, I, I think, you know, real estate, just talking about real estate as an asset class, is, is very interesting because to me, I don't think you can lump everything in and say all real estate is the same. Um, there's a huge differences between, you know, industrial warehouse properties, commercial real estate, office obviously has its own serious issues right now, residential. And, and obviously it's also based on where exactly you are. Enormous differences between overpriced residential property in San Francisco right now um, versus, you know, warehouses in in uh, Dallas Fort Worth huge huge differences um, uh, I've done a lot of investing in uh, in for example in agricultural land um, in Latin America and um, actually got my start in in kind of multifamily uh, units I mean way back when I was actually still in the military uh, a long time ago um, but I think in general real estate is is uh, I still think real estate is actually a very useful asset class because I, it's, it's very difficult for me to see a scenario in the future that is not very inflationary. And I think having real estate in general terms, we can talk about more specifics, but I think having real estate and real assets in general, and we can talk about kind of what that means, real assets in general in an inflationary environment really does make a ton of sense. Um, but, you know, there's definitely a lot of headwinds, I think, especially if you start peeling back the layers of that and looking at, you know, specific subcategories in that asset class. Well, let's talk about residential okay. for homeowners. Sure. Because, I mean, right now we're in probably the worst affordability that I've seen in 35 years, probably since World War II, mm -hmm. when FHA was created because there were five and six year mortgages on houses interest only and they ballooned and everybody was losing their their home right. um but you're a systems guy i mean you're in the military you know uh you're smart you said that a lot of these people are just kind of flying by the seat of their pants making decisions as they go along but i mean how is that happening i mean why do you think there's a i mean are they idiots or I mean, you know that's running our country i mean you know is the fed a bunch of idiots i mean what what are they doing with monetary policy? Why would they let this asset class for people that need it, the commodity that people need a roof over their head? Why in the world would they let it get to a point of, you know, unaffordability to where it is right now, where you need seven, eight times earnings yeah. to buy a house? Yeah, it's uh, so start with the basics. Uh, I like to say that um, they may be dumb, but they're not stupid. Uh, I mean, people at the Federal Reserve are very intelligent people. They're some of the most Oops. highly educated. Well, and on top of that, though, Jerome Powell is an incredibly successful guy. He's a very a successful guy. He's worth a lot of money. The guy's made a lot of money legitimately. I mean, like he's very, very clever. In, I mean, guy understands finance. I think completely out of touch with the normal guy. You know, I mean, you go back to sort of like the Joe the Plumber guy back from 2008. I mean, Jerome Powell has no clue who uh, how the how how the you know sort of average person in the united states lives um but at the same time they act in the, some of the most idiotic ways and you, you said you know book smart that's true like they they're experts and so they rely on other experts and their expert theories and these things that basically just don't add up in the real world people go and they write you know extensive phd dissertations on on all these things about interest rate policy and what's going to happen and all that stuff has proven to be totally false 
It's been completely and totally false. Well, I mean, it's they, backward looking too. I mean, they're looking at data from months old. Yeah, I, I don't think they even understand. I mean, Jerome Powell actually said it himself, and it was at a, I think it was at a Bloomberg event. And he said, "We finally understand how little we understand about inflation," and that should be terrifying coming from the, you know, the head of the central bank in the United States, and yet it was just sort of like glossed over. I mean, this was the guy two days before Silicon Valley Bank went bust was testifying in front of Congress and said, hey, there's, he said, there's nothing in the data that suggests to me that we've tightened too quickly or that we've, we've, we've uh, you know, engaged monetary policy too, too, too fast, too quickly. Essentially saying there's no problems here, nothing to see here. They had all the data. Silicon Valley Bank was basically posting its insolvency back in December in Q4, in Q4 of 2022. And the Federal Reserve had access to all that data, not only because it's a public company, but because the Federal Reserve is a supervisor of the entire banking system, right? So Silicon Valley Bank is a member of the Federal Reserve system. So they're supervised by the Federal Reserve. The Fed had all access to all of that. So they should have known, they should have seen it, they didn't see it. And the guy testifies in front of Congress said, you know, hey, there's no problems here. So it's not that he's stupid. It's that their whole, the, the entire system that's been designed around them is just wrong. It's just completely and totally wrong. And so I think you could make the same argument about, uh, about the government. Um, I don't want to opine on the IQ of our president. Um, frankly, I, I think there's a lot to be said uh, there. But let's just say, you know, the, the people that run the government in general, as opposed to just one person, like, I don't think that these are people of low IQ. Um, I think in many respects, they just tend to be very optimistic. I think they're blinded by there's a certain fanaticism about their their ideology, about their agenda, that they want to do certain things. And so they just there's no there's no long term thinking. There's no vision. Like when you run a business. You know, very, very intelligent people that get promoted to CEOs. I mean, their, their responsibility is to establish a vision for the business and say, this is where we want to take this company in the future. And they take steps to actually build that. I mean, you know, Jeff Bezos was very clear. You read his annual letters back in the 1990s and saying, this is where we want Amazon to be in the future. This is a guy that had a very clear vision and built the company in that direction. Politicians don't do that anymore. They don't come out and say like, here's, here's what we want. Here's the vision that we're trying to create, all these things. They, they, instead, it's just very haphazard uh, opportunistic decisions and they tend to be very very short-sighted um, and i think that's a big reason why why we're in this position right now that's very interesting so they're what you're essentially saying is they're interested in their term yeah i think they're Not i think really especially the, also interested in making sure that nothing blows up on their watch right nothing really horrible 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 happens on their watch social security is a great example right you read the annual report of the social security trustees and they say in 2033 Social Security's primary uh, trust fund, the OAS trust fund, will run out of money. It will be fully depleted. There will be no more money in its primary trust fund. Now, that should be terrifying. And ten with, years. Right. Exactly. That's 10 years from now. Um, uh, on top of that, the Congressional Budget Office says that two years before that, in 2031, interest rates, uh, sorry, the interest bill on the national debt will be so high and entitlement spending for Social Security will be so high that those two things alone Mandatory entitlements and interest on the debt will consume 100% of tax revenue. That's in 2031, wow. right? That's in 2031. I mean, that's not that far away. So you would think that, for example, Congress has access to that information. It's coming from the Congressional Budget Office. You would think that they would have access to that information. You would think that the President of the United States has access to that information. And they would get together and they'd say like, geez, we got to figure this out. We got to have a long-term vision, make sure that the country is still solvent eight years from now. But instead, you know, it's, it's, it's all it's, everything else is more important. I guess if they if they don't talk about it, yeah, it's la la la. la. They yeah. just you know, it just does. It's, it's no a problem doesn't exist. It'd be somebody else's problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I had um, let's talk about uh, home prices because yeah. they've gone up. And I I watch a lot of shows, and I have my own show, and I've been in this business yeah. for a long time. I have never heard anybody describe the housing market in a few sentences as i heard you say about how the prices fluctuate and i think you were really kind of when you were to contextualize it i think you were really talking about on an investment side hmm. but we grew up with the american dream right. of of for most people they they never invest in anything other than their primary residence right. i mean for many people i mean if you talk to tax planners they'll say that's like the the biggest mistake 
Nobody plans for retirement. Nobody invests other than they buy a house and they think, hey, I'm going to live off of that one. I need to. But you had, you were talking about how when somebody buys shares of stocks or sells shares of stocks, you were saying that that purchase doesn't really move the market. All right. But then you said with real estate, because there are fewer investors in the pool, mm-hmm. and I think about somebody buying a house, they can really move that market rather quickly. We right. watched it, right? So what do you think? I mean, so knowing that and 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 I'm taking that in application in the residential housing business, I'm saying, OK, so just like money in our pocket, the reason why it has value is because we have the confidence to know that we can go out. It's work for us, right? We can go out tomorrow and buy something or today and buy something with the money in our pocket. Well, when you're in the housing market and you own a house and you see the neighbor sell for three hundred thousand more You know, you're like, wow, my house is now worth, you know, 300,000 more. And and the buyers really inflated that on a very small scale, small amount of buyers very quickly. Right. What do you think is going to happen now that the the affordability is basically not there? It's horrible. Right. It's horrible. So what will happen? Yeah. What? uh, So the 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 point he made again, like if if you and I go out and buy Apple stock, Big deal. It's not going to move the price. You could buy a million dollars worth of Apple stock. You could buy $10 million worth of Apple stock. It's not going to move the price. But you're right. What happens is uh, what I was talking about know, some time ago that I that I, I think I did that podcast. And, and Before prices went crazy. Yeah, exactly. And basically said, look, like when when uh, when the guy down the street, if there's especially if there's not a lot of inventory um, and and the guy down the street sells his house for a higher price, there's this weird phenomenon in real estate that suddenly you know, people talk, they, they, they see in the MLS, the neighbors start Zillow. talking about it and every, right, they see it in Zillow and everybody starts, they anchor themselves this idea They go, Oh, now my house is worth all this money too. And, and, you know, well, we have no idea what the circumstances of that, of that sale were. It's possible that the guy that bought it, maybe that guy was a complete idiot. Maybe he's like, maybe he was laundering money. You know, he just like, he, he just came in some ill gotten gains that he's like, I got to get rid of this money somehow. So I'm going to go and buy real estate in an asset protection jurisdiction like Florida, where they can't take my house away. You know, something like this, this could be all kinds of circumstances for why somebody paid what they paid when they did it, all those things, uh, all those nuances are obviously lost in the market. All we know is like, Oh, he paid, you know, 200,000, $300,000 over, over what we price. thought was the the market price. Therefore, everybody else's house is worth that. And so everybody has this sort of psychological anchor now to what they think their house is worth. And this becomes actually one of the biggest problems in the market that leads to this, a lack of really inventory in the market. And so what I, what I think is happening, and frankly, right here in Puerto Rico is a great example. Prices here went through the roof. In a way that every time I talk to people stateside and they go, oh, my, you know, the, my neighborhood prices went up crazy. I go, dude, that's nothing compared to what happened in Puerto Rico. I mean, we're talking in, in some respects, even 10x wow. or more unbelievable increases in, what period of time? in values. 15 months. Really? Yeah. I mean, it was it was um, in during um, COVID times. Um, I remember, I mean, there were places that were selling for you know, higher end places, you know, that were selling for, you know, 3 million, 4 million that, uh, you know, by probably the end of 21 going into 22, um, you know, mid 22 were 15, 16 million, you know, or more. And, and, you know, I mean, and that's, and it's funny is because you started seeing those same things. Everybody, even on the lower end, like I have, um, I remember my, my in-laws, they came, uh, my wife is Ukrainian and we were able to get my in-laws in. We had to pull a lot of strings. We were able to get my in-laws brought in from Ukraine and we got them into Puerto Rico and trying to find a house for them to rent in this sort of top, top, top end of the market. Everybody who had like the crappiest place you could imagine thought that they owned the Taj Mahal <laughs> and even just to rent it out for some, some crappy little place, you know, everybody wants $8,000 a month, $10,000 a month. Oh. And it's like, you people are insane. It's like You're insane. Stateside. Right, exactly. I mean, but I mean, we're t- it's just like a shack. It's like a nothing, right. you know? And so this is the sort of thing that happens is like people get psychologically anchored. And then when all of a sudden the market starts to change, interest rates go up, um, you know, what, what oftentimes happens, you know, and honestly, it's, it's the realtors are, are so culpable in this because realtors, 
you're right. They start cheerleading the market. Say, oh, they start saying things like we. He's like nonsensical things like we're just waiting for the market to catch up. And things that don't like, what does that even mean? You'll be sorry you know, if you don't like, buy now. Right. All these like silly things. And and the reality is, is that most people don't understand central banking. They don't understand the impact of interest rates. They don't understand all these things that are that are happening. And so the pool of buyers really starts to dry up. But we're in this period now, which I think is actually the worst part of the cycle, is that the sellers, we're in this part of the cycle where the sellers haven't capitulated yet. The sellers haven't gotten it through their thick skulls that it's not 2021 anymore. It's not 2022 anymore. And that they're, the prices of their homes, the values of their homes are worth a lot less than the way it used to be. But their asking prices are still astronomical. And so, uh, you know, what, what we saw is that a lot of people put their houses on the market over the past few months. They weren't getting the bids they wanted or even no bid at all. And so rather than lower the price, they just say, all right, I'm just going to take it off the market. Exactly. So you end up with less inventory. Yet at the same time, there's still buyers. They're people that, for whatever reason, they didn't buy over the past few years. They didn't get that two and a half percent interest rate, and so now they're like, "Geez, I got you know, I got kids. I got whatever. I got to buy. I've got to move. My job's forcing me to move, so I have to move." And so they have to go. They have to pay. But again, it's very, very limited volume. So it's like one poor sucker has to go and pay some like fairly high price still for a house, and everybody goes, "Aha! You see, you see, the market's still strong, but it's not strong." Because if it were really strong, there would be lots of volume. There would be so much inventory flying off the market at record high prices. But that's not what's happening. And so if you actually look at, if everybody really put their house on the market, I mean, everybody that really needed to sell, put their house on the market, all the people that really buy, and, the, and there was actually a functioning market out there, especially without government manipulation and all these things, these, these special loan programs that now the banks are having to put in in certain parts of communities and so forth. They got rid of all that and said, let's let the market sort it out. Prices would plummet. I mean, they would really plummet. They would not be anywhere near as high uh, as they are today because, uh, you know, as you point out, like affordability at the end of the day, affordability is the only thing that matters when it comes to housing. Do you think that's going to happen? No. You don't think the prices are going to plummet? I think they I think they will. But I think there's enough people now where uh, people don't have to move in the same levels they used to. Right. Everybody's kind of accustomed to remote working. So you got people that have locked in, you know, two and a half, three percent mortgages that they don't want to give that up. Uh, they don't have to move even if they get a new job, you know. And so I think because that that'll prevent a lot of sellers from feeling like they've got to go. A lot of prospective buyers, you know, people just sort of again, everybody will just sort of say, Meh, and they'll just sort of stay put where they are. And I think we're probably in for a period where there's very, very limited volume. Mm -hmm. I think you will find eventually. Um, I mean, rental prices are going to have to come down because uh, eventually it's going to get to the point where affordability is going to drive rental demand first. People that have a lot of investment properties, like those guys are probably going to capitulate. I know a couple of people here in Puerto Rico um, during that big boom period, they bought lots and lots and lots of property and they are trying to offload. And we're seeing uh, you know, prices they're asking, I mean, uh, they're down 50% in terms of their asking price. I knew a guy, he had a relatively small condo, he was asking $4 million in late 21. Now he's down to 1.7. Had a buyer. That's a big drop. Had a buyer and, and the deal fell through. And he's probably crying about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, and so, but at the same time, like, I know he probably got in when it was like 600,000. So, so he's still okay. So he's still yeah. he's still up, but I think he's smart enough to realize that this isn't you know we're not going to go we're not going to see you know four million dollar it might be drifting down. So I want to I want to sell while I can and get some liquidity. You know, uh, you made a statement about um, homes not really being uh, fungible, right? And um, you know, me working in the industry, I have a little different perspective. I mean, no one knows. I mean, no, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I don't know whether I'll be right with my, you know, thought process. Of, I mean, the government could obviously change things in a minute, right? Uh, with more stimulus or mortgage-backed securities, whatever. Um, but I think one of the reasons why the market cheerleads, at least the ones that are in the market, the ones that re are responsible for paying their own bills, their own mortgages in the industry from transactions, houses being bought and sold they look at the uh they look at the trend line over i mean it, just go back to the 1950s uh if you're looking at fred charts or any real data um if you believe the data but you can believe what has happened and that is real estate has appreciated over time mm -hmm. and we do know that we don't know whether 2008 was an anomaly or not because we're kind of in a bigger bubble now than we were back then but um 
but you see it it lasts over time the the issue that i have james is that for a lot of the people eight million people that have bought in the last several years um they paid top dollar and because right. properties aren't fungible they paid top dollars top dollar for for homes that they wouldn't have bought if there was more inventory right you know maybe it's a bad piece of property right, right? a bad house right um but they paid a lot for it because of that particular time um makes me think of location 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 right. when i hear you talk about the fungibility right. you know uh homes not being fungible I mean, what do you think about those particular properties? And I mean, do you believe that they could drop drastically and wouldn't they change the comparable market and, you know, the way homes appraise? Yeah, I again, there's always it's going to this phase in the cycle where sellers haven't capitulated. That's not going to last forever. And I think there is going to be a point where uh, it'll probably start with rents because the rental uh, rental is, I mean, somebody just literally doesn't have the money. They can't pay that level of rent. And if from a macro perspective, if nobody can afford to pay that level of rent, rents are going to have to come down. And if rents that's come gonna down, the investors. that's going to hurt the investors. And so that'll be the first sort of wave of people that capitulates is going to be the investors. Mom and pops. Right. And so like that's that'll start the... And again, since we're psychologically anchored because, oh, Zillow, my Zestimate says, you know, this. And I think like Zillow, in my opinion, is a totally off, just different tangent. But like Zillow, in my opinion, is just one of the worst things to have happened to the real estate market because it has anchored so many people and their expectations. This is what my property is worth because Zillow says so. And I don't know when Zillow became, you know, the expert. And they've, frankly, they've admitted that there are a lot of issues with their internal systems. I mean, they talk about this stuff. They lost a lot of money because right. of they it. lost a lot of money because of this. <laughs> right. So, like the guys who say, like, this is what your house is worth, lost a shitload of money, you know, betting actual real money on what they thought houses were worth. It turns out, oh, the houses weren't actually worth that. So, why anybody even listens to Zillow and says this is what the house is worth? I think Zillow is one of the things that's keeping sellers from capitulating. Keeping Amen. them, it's keeping them psychologically. When's their class action lawsuit? Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They went after the real estate. Starting. Yeah, I'll go after Zillow. So, so the the I think it'll be you know rents will come down. The investors have to capitulate, and that becomes then the psychological de-anchoring of people go, oh my god, you know, and now people go, I gotta, I need to panic sell what I can. I'm gonna, I gotta panic sell because now. I'm going to, yeah, I got this house I don't really like, but I'm going to suck it up because I got a 3% mortgage and, you know, Zillow tells me that the the price is still high. All of a sudden they start seeing all this inventory come on the market. That has a psychological impact as well. With so, a different price. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They, they, exactly. they weren't and expecting. So that's, that's kind of my, my view, but you know, there, there are a lot of different factors. And one of the things that we didn't really talk about is I think that is very important is what's happening in the banking system. The banking system, Silicon Valley Bank was not an isolated uh, issue at all. In fact, the, the one that's way bigger than Silicon Valley Bank is actually Bank of America. Bank of America has way more oh. uh, exposure. I mean, Bank of America is sitting on enormous, enormous they unrealized got a losses. Lot because of Silicon Valley. That, that's right. I mean, a yeah. lot of billions of dollars, right? Yeah. And, and they did the same thing. As, every bank did what Silicon Valley Bank did. Silicon Valley Bank went bust, not because they, they bet on, you know, toxic, you know, mortgage backed securities and CDOs and all that stuff that, that made the banks go bust in 2008. They bought United States treasuries. They bought U.S. government bonds. And if you don't understand anything about the bond market, you just got to understand that as interest rates go up, the value of the bonds that you already bought before goes down, right? And so interest rates have gone up a lot. Silicon Valley Bank bought all these bonds when the bond yields were basically three basis points, 0.03%. Well, now they're, you know, 5%. So Silicon Valley Bank, because interest rates went up, the value of all the bonds they bought at record high prices plummeted. So they're sitting on huge, huge, huge losses. Well, Bank of America's losses completely dwarf Silicon Valley Bank's losses. Bank of America is sitting on enormous losses. And so as long as interest rates stay where they are, and if they, if they keep going higher, then like, you know, God help all the banks. But if, even if they stay high, then the bank's unrealized losses are still absolutely enormous. And the banks have been playing these like really quirky accounting tricks, what they do. And it's a, it's a, it's this weird sort of banking nuance, something they call available for sale versus hold to maturity. It's a way banks classify their bonds. And essentially banks can play this very clever trick where they can reclassify their bonds in a different way 
that gives them the opportunity to sort of pretend that those unrealized losses don't exist. And so trickery. They, it's trickery. It's a way for them to deliberately misstate their actual financial condition. And so Bank of America has been the king. When does it show up? This. Uh, well, it shows up if and when there's actually in a couple of ways in Silicon Valley Bank's uh, case, it showed up because they had a lot of withdrawals and they weren't able to honor those withdrawals because it turned out they had lost all that money in their bond portfolio. But there are a lot of other ways in which it can show up. One way in which it shows up is um, in the event that the government has to continue borrowing tons and tons of money. Um, and if the government has to do that, this is actually one of the things that will actually be a problem for the housing market is that the government – if the central bank isn't printing money, because this is what it's been for years and years, is that the central, every time the government wanted to borrow money, there was the Federal Reserve saying, oh, we'll print a bunch of money. They don't actually physically print it, but figuratively speaking, they print the money and they give it to the government, right? And now what's happening is the Federal Reserve saying, well, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to actually expand the money supply anymore. So now when the government overspends, you know, trillions of dollars in deficit spending, they just spent almost $2 trillion, uh, another, another uh, deficit that just closed in this last fiscal year, uh, and they're, they're going to keep spending more and more and more money. Well, now that's got to come from the private sector. Now that deficit spending has to be financed by the banks. So now you've got banks that instead of investing in the housing market, they've got to go and invest more money in U.S. government bonds, U.S. treasuries, right? So this is less money that they can spend on mortgages uh, to go and finance housing and so forth. So this is where we actually start seeing a scenario where interest rates go up even, even more, um, which in and of itself is actually bad for the banks and it's bad for real estate prices. It's bad for the, for the housing taking market. it directly to the, the investors of the loans. So right. now they want more money than the government will accept. That's right. So yeah. They're not going to just do a 4% mortgage. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so it, it hits sort of across the board. And I think, again, you start seeing the pain among investors first, uh, people that are out doing, uh, uh, you know, large, you know, multifamily guys that are doing big projects to build apartments with, you know, uh, three, 400 doors at a time, you know, they require certain cap rates, they require, uh, you know, certain financing rates and so forth. A lot of that stuff is just going to disappear. Their loans entirely. come up for renewal. Right. And their interest rates double right. if they can refinance in the first place. That's right. Because a lot of people, a lot of the uh, lenders don't have appetites for it. They right. know what's coming on, right. million, million and a half of inventory in multifamily units. You know, uh, James, what do you tell, by, for me, being in my business, I mean, with your experience in finance and, you know, knowing what's going on kind of behind the scenes, what do you tell buyers and sellers right now? Well, that, first, the buyers. I mean, do you tell them to keep renting? That rents are going to come down? Don't worry about it. You know, it just depends on somebody's situation. I think if you're, if you're, you know, if you're older, you know, you don't have kids in the house, you're a little bit more flexible, you're single, that sort of thing. And you have the flexibility in your life where you can rent. That probably makes sense right now. Um, obviously, you know, if you've got to have, you've got children, you need to anchor, you know, you can't, you can't afford not financially, but afford in terms of your lifestyle to go year to year and possibly have to, you know, get thrown out of your house and, and, and move somewhere else every single year. You know, if you got, you know, kids in school age, et cetera, you can't really do that. Some people might have to, you know, where buyers have to capitulate and say, all right, whatever, I'll pay what I got to pay. And what it ends up meaning for a lot of people is that, especially if you're, if you're not a cash buyer and you've got to get a mortgage, like you're probably going to have to reduce your expectations a little bit. Um, but there are places, if you have flexibility, if you have a, a remote job, and you have the ability to live where you want to live. There are plenty of places where affordability is still uh, a lot better, a lot, lot better. You can get so much more for your money if you're able to move uh, across the country or even across the world. There are so many more places that you can go where your your housing dollar gets stretched so much farther than, than you ever thought. So that would be something that I would I would consider if you have the flexibility to do that. You go, I you have, have to buy. <laughs> sure, right. and my you did uh, it yourself, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, um, but that's 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 really I think the, the 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 best way to look at it is you know you either have to just shake your head and be angry when you write that check, or you try and and if you have the flexibility, negotiate with your employer or whatever, and and just say, look, I've got I've got to go to a place where I can tick certain boxes and the housing affordability is, you know, instead of paying $600,000, I can pay three fifty and get a nicer place. You might really want to strongly consider that. Yeah. Yeah. How about sellers? <laughs> you know, it's, I think liquidity makes a lot of sense right now. And I think if, if you have the, if you have the, if you have the ability to sell, um, you know, and, and, and put some money in your pocket, 
I, I don't think there's any shame in that whatsoever. I don't, I don't think anybody that actually sells and gets liquidity right now should be losing a whole lot of sleep. So if you if you have the ability to do it, um, you know, I, I think it certainly makes sense to do so. Obviously, everybody's situation is is very very specific, and I know I was actually talking to a friend, you know, last week who had a place, um, you know, older guy, and and he was he's you know saying like he had this. He actually had somebody come and make an unsolicited offer, but he was, you know, really kind of uh, waffling about it because he said, like, I, I want my grandkids to to be able to enjoy this place. It's, you know, it's seen it kind of a vacation place, you know, whatever. And it, sure, I get it. And everybody's going to have their own, you know, their own circumstances. But, you know, what we're looking at in the in the future, there are a lot of problems in the U.S. economy. There are problems in the U.S. banking system. There are a lot of banks right now that are sitting on 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 enormous unrealized losses that that could eventually become realized losses frankly the total and this is all publicly available data by the way this isn't this isn't me saying this this is literally the fdic and the fed that pool this data together the unrealized losses in the u.s banking system right now exceed all u.s uh bank equity in the entire u.s banking system okay that should be terrifying for people who really actually understand banking that's crazy what do you do with your money i mean if you you know if you sell your house you take this equity, where do you put it? Well, Peter's going to come here in a minute and he's going to tell everybody they should buy gold. <laughs> right. uh, and I think I think gold makes a lot of sense. So I don't want to steal his thunder. But I think I, I, I open with this kind of talking about real assets. And I think real assets make a lot of sense. These are things that actually don't rely on the government, things that actually have real functional utility, intrinsic value, scarcity, et cetera, that don't depend on the government. And this is a lot of things. It can even include intellectual property, in my opinion, which a lot of people don't don't include as, as, as a real asset. I absolutely do. I do think real estate um, can uh, and is an, a, a real asset. And I think longer term, I think real estate is definitely a sensible thing to own, but there are a lot of issues that have to get worked out um, in the United States, in the U.S. economy. And again, banking is one of them. Um, government deficits are another one. Again, we talk about CBO projections and Social Security. I mean, this stuff is, this stuff is, I mean, seven years is within a real estate, a single real estate cycle. So if you're talking about in seven years, the government is going to be so heavily indebted and spending so much money on entitlements that they're going to consume 100% of tax revenue just on those two things, the military, the light bill at the White House, Homeland Security, all these things that we think of as government, well, all of it have to be debt funded. I mean, that's, again, that's terrifying. And all those things have impacts on interest rates, monetary policy, fiscal policy, which do have an impact on housing prices, um, that have an impact on mortgage rates. So these are the sorts of things to, to think about. But I having... Uh, you know, having something that actually is scarce does make sense. If you go back to history and you look at uh, countries that have experienced severe economic hardship because they had banking crises, because they had a currency that got into serious trouble, because they had a government reach this position where they consumed, uh, you know, in, in places where debt service consumed alone more than 100% of their tax revenue, what happened? What happened to housing? What happened to real estate? Well, what you found was that, for example, residential usually fell under price controls. Politicians came in and said, no, 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 you're not allowed to raise rents. You're not allowed to do these They're sorts of things. doing it now. Right, but they couldn't do that, for example, with uh, industrial property, agricultural property. Some, so all real estate is not the same. We started talking about that earlier. All real estate is not the same. And there are nuances, I think, to some forms of the asset class that are different. And it's true that uh, residential real estate in times of severe hardship will probably be subject to price controls and rent controls and so forth that other types of real estate will not be subject to. Nobody's going to talk about rent control for warehouses, uh, but they will be talking about rent control in, in New York City apartments and, and these sorts of things. And so that's going to have an impact on on prices. So I think, um, you know, people that have a very long term view really ought to consider the big you know, macro story and think about what's a really, you know, what's what's the what's the safest way to own real estate if it's from an investor perspective over the long term. Again, if you talk about like, I got to have a place for my kids, your children 100% are head and shoulders of priority one above everything else and don't even think about the long-term investment implications. Um, but if you're thinking about, you know, where do I put my money? I think real estate over the long term is still a sensible place to put money because it is a real asset. But I think you've just got to consider that with, the headwinds that are facing the U.S. economy right now, issues in the banking system, issues with government spending, how that impacts interest rates, fiscal policy, monetary policy, um, and you know, and and just think through the logical conclusion of where that goes. And again, overpriced residential real estate in New York City or San Francisco probably a little bit different than 
industrial property in Fort Worth, Texas, or uh, you know, high quality farmland somewhere. That's just totally different stories. Yeah, great perspective, great information. So, how how does everyone follow you? Oh well, uh, I mean, at the moment we're still at uh, sovereignman.com, uh, though exciting news to follow. Yeah, well, yeah. we're excited to hear it. Well, okay, we great. thank you so much. Okay, thanks so much. Talk to you soon. As you could see, James and Peter Schiff are pretty close. I mean, we were in Peter's home, uh, but I really did enjoy the opportunity to meet James. And he, geez, he shared a wealth of knowledge in this video. So guys, if you have a comment, you could drop it below. Uh, if you like the video, you can let James and I know that you did by smashing that thumbs up button. And as always, guys, we love it when you subscribe to our channel, hit the alert bell, you'll know every time we post content. And like I said in the intro, it would be great if you could share this video with your family and friends. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.